Well, the last three times that I've taught a class or preached a sermon, I did it while sitting. Like Tommy used to when he was a one-legged preacher. Easier, isn't it? Oh, it's good to see you. And we thank you for those of you who are at home watching on Facebook. Luke chapter 15 is a wonderful chapter in the Word of God. Jesus is in the city of Jerusalem, and He in the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by all of the different people who live there. By the way, Zach, I appreciated that prayer. Thank you. Uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and here's all these different people. And, and you know what Jesus does? He associates with all of them. Doesn't matter who they are. In fact, the Bible tells us in Luke 15 that, that in the morning probably that Jesus had gone to the home of a Pharisee and had eaten food there with a, a man that was a, a Pharisee. And then later on in the day, the Bible tells us that He associated with publicans and sinners. Boy, that's the two opposites, isn't it? You got the Pharisees over here, and you got the publicans and sinners over here. The Pharisees think that, that they're the tops, and the publicans and sinners are the absolute dread of society. But Jesus associates, you see, with all of them. To the Lord, all souls are precious. Amen. And in order to get this idea of a, of a soul being precious, no matter who it belongs to, Jesus begins to teach in Luke 15 some beautiful parables. The first one that He talks about is a parable of a, of a lost sheep. A man was a shepherd and he had a hundred sheep. And suddenly he can't find one. So what's he going to do? Well, Jesus says he leaves the 99 in order to go out and to find that one that was lost. And Jesus finds that sheep, and when he does, or Jesus, the shepherd, Jesus, the good shepherd, this was just a shepherd. The shepherd finds that sheep, and when he finds it, he calls all these neighbors and friends together, and they celebrate. Because here, this sheep that had been lost is now found. Then the Lord goes on and He teaches these publicans and sinners about what He calls the lost coin. A woman had coins in her house, money. And she looks one day and there's one that's missing. So what does she do? Well, Jesus says she lights a candle. And she begins to search in the house. And she searches everywhere in the house. And finally she finds that, that coin that she had lost. And what does she do? She calls her neighbors and friends together. And they celebrate. Because that which had been lost was now found. And finally Jesus teaches the parable of the, the lost son. Oh, you... You know that parable. That son who took his inheritance from his father went out into the world and blew it. Wasted it all on wine, woman, and, and song. You've heard the old adage, a fool and his money are soon parted. Well, that's what happened. This young son got his inheritance from his dad and he went out and it wasn't long until he well, he was so broke that he had to get a job where he was, and the job that he was able to get was feeding the pigs, tending the swine, King James says. It got to the point that the young man would have gladly eaten that which the hogs were eating, but nobody gave to him to eat. Upon realizing this, the young man decided, I'll go back home to my father. 
Because he remembered what it was like back there. His father had servants who worked for him. And the son says, my father's servants have more than enough to eat. And here am I starving. So what I'll do, I'll go back to my father. Well, while this son was still a long way off, the Bible says the father saw him coming. Probably had been looking for a long time. And he saw that son coming and, and the father runs out to him and says he embraces his son and he kisses his son. And the father is going to restore that son to his place as being his full son as he was before. And then what does the father do? He gathers all his friends and neighbors together and they have a party. This my son was lost and now is found. He was dead and he is alive. All of these parables that Jesus spoke were designed to get people to try to realize how much the Heavenly Father loves us and wants us, desires us who are lost to be found to be saved, to be able to be with Him forever in that wonderful place called heaven. Now, normally, whenever we think of that last parable, we talked about the parable of the lost son. What do we normally call that son? Yeah, he's, he's the prodigal son. And I'll be honest with you, if you ask the majority of the people what does prodigal mean, They'll scratch their head. A lot of people think, well, prodigal undoubtedly, undoubtedly must mean disobedient. It must be wild-willed. Um, it, it must be something like that. Now, I admit that the word prodigal is not found in the King James Bible anywhere. But that's the name that we've given this boy. But the word prodigal doesn't mean disobedient. It doesn't mean wild-willed. It doesn't mean mean... It means wasteful. Yeah, wasteful. And certainly, this young man was wasteful. He took his inheritance and it wasn't long until all that his father had given to him was gone. You probably, I know I do, I know of at least two cases where individuals received a large amount of money. One of them was because of a death in his family and he ended up being an heir to uh, a part of the insurance money or the money that was left. The other one involved an individual whose wife and two children whom he was away from and hadn't been with for a long time and didn't seem to care too much. But anyway, uh, they were all killed. And each one of them had a large insurance policy. You know, in both cases, both of these cases, I remember that it wasn't long until this young man who had inherited money and this other one who had got insurance money, you know what shape they were in? Broke. They were broke. In fact, the one who got the insurance money, a million dollars, he had to go back to working a a job that paid minimum wage. Well, as I thought about this wonderful parable, the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son, it exhibits the love of the Almighty to man. And I couldn't help but consider the fact that folks today can be and are not just physically but also spiritually, like this young son, we can be wasteful. The United States of America makes up 4% of the entire population of the world. But we produce 30% of the waste that's made on the planet. Each American throws out seven pounds of trash per person per day. That means that in a year's time, 
I throw out 2,555 pounds of trash, and you do too. Almost 15% of what we throw away is food stuff. That means the average family throws away a ton of food a year. Yeah, we're wasteful. I remember t attending a class when I was much younger, class being taught by a sound gospel preacher, and, and he was teaching in this class the fact that Jesus, although, although Jesus was the creator of the world, the universe, and all that is therein, Jesus did all He could to keep from being wasteful. Somewhere on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus said, Jesus fed 5,000 men. Now the Bible says that the men weren't all that were there. There was also women and children. So the total number we're not sure of. But Jesus had fed 5,000 men. Then He fed women and children. And He did so with five loaves and two fishes. Now, after everybody had eaten all that they wanted, the Bible says, what remained was not thrown away. Rather, the Bible says in Matthew 14, 20, that they took up they took up the fragments, they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. A while later, at the Sea of Galilee, or out just, just offside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus feeds 4,000 men, not counting the women and the children. And He does so with, with seven loaves and a few little fishes. And after all did eat and were filled, there were seven baskets full of food taken up and saved. You see, Jesus believed in and practiced conserving what the earth produced. Gave us an example to follow. We eat leftovers, do you? Some people don't eat leftovers. If you eat leftovers, you're doing just exactly what the life of Jesus exemplified there. But, but let's consider this morning not how wasteful we may be with physical things, but how wasteful we may be when it comes to the spiritual things of life. For example, how many opportunities to worship with God's people do we let pass by without taking advantage of them? The psalmist in Psalms 122 and verse 1 said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, if David was living today, you know what he'd be saying? I can't wait to go to church. Psalms 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Let's face it, if again David were living today, you know what he'd be saying? He'd be saying, I can't wait to be with my brothers and sisters. Now, I know that during this time of uncertainty due to the coronavirus, Many people are afraid to take the chance of going out and being exposed to something that, that could be harmful, even deadly, to them. But even before the virus came on the scene, there, there were many who, who didn't seem to mind at all to find an excuse to miss church services. You know, if we're able to come to church on Sunday morning, we probably are able to come on Sunday night. And probably able to come on Wednesday night. Why is it so important to go to church? Here's what the Hebrew writer says. Hebrews 10, 23-25. Normally we go to verse 25. But, but let's not go straight to 25. Let's find out why he says 25. Let's go to 23. Let's begin there. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. What does it mean to hold fast the profession of your faith? Well, the words hold fast are from one Greek word, katexo. 
It means to retain. In other words, the Hebrew writer says, right off, he says you need to keep on keeping on what you're claiming. You claim to be a Christian, then you keep on keeping on claiming to be a Christian. Then he says, for he is faithful that promised. Hey, God keeps His Word. If God keeps His Word, you need to keep your Word too. And let us consider one another and provoke one another unto love and good works. Let's face it. Without being with somebody, you cannot provoke them unto love and to good works. Provoke, provoke in the original language means to incite or to move to action. What can we do to incite or to move others to action in their Christian lives? Let's face it. He says, keep on keeping on this Christian life. What you do is you need to consider one another and incite them unto love and good works. How are we going to do that? Verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Not only do we owe it to God to be here when the doors are open, we owe it to each other to be here when the doors are open. God says when the church meets, if you're a member of the church, you need to be meeting with her. Why? Because it's the opportunity that you have to build each other up and show the world that you are indeed a Christian. If a person fails to meet with the brethren at every opportunity, then you know what we're being? We're being wasteful. Wasteful with the beautiful option that's been presented to us to help others grow in the faith and to show ourselves a precious child of God. Don't be like the prodigal son. Don't be wasteful with the opportunities that we have. Don't be wasteful by neglecting the precious gift of salvation that's been offered to you. Everybody get their stimulus? Just me? You? 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 Yeah. No? Wow. I got my stimulus. I'll admit it. And you know where it's at? It's in the bank. <laughs> I took it. In fact, just about everybody that you would ask, will you turn it down or will you take it, the stimulus? You know what almost everybody will say? I'll take it. They might hate the United States of America. They might hate the government. But you know what they'll do? I'll take it. <clears throat> Did you earn it? No, not really. We didn't really earn it. I need it. I need it. Why is it? Why is it that we look forward to? As soon as people heard that there's going to be a stimulus check, they probably started getting on the internet to find out when it's going to be there. Why is it? <coughs> that we look forward to and gladly accept a gift from the government of the money received as a stimulus check. Yet when offered the greatest gift that could ever be offered, a gift of life eternal, often will refuse to take advantage of it. We're able to read in the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. We almost greedily will grab the stimulus, yet turn down a presentation of the possibility of eternal life. Listen, isn't that a waste? Isn't this being prodigal? Peter knew the importance of taking advantage of the God-given offer. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, 
He proclaimed to those on that day of Pentecost. He said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Don't be prodigal. Don't be wasteful. Don't put away this opportunity that you have. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You know the reason Christ came to this earth was in order to do the will of the Father. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. What was the Father's will? Well, we read in 1 Timothy 1.15, it's a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul goes on and says, of whom I am chief. But that's the Father's will. The salvation of souls. The salvation of mankind. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. What a gift that we've been offered. To have our sins borne by someone else. To have another willing to suffer the consequences of the evils that we ourselves have performed. Listen, wouldn't it be a waste to ignore such a possibility? Yet according to the Lord, the majority will be wasteful. They will be prodigal. It's in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Don't waste an opportunity to gain this wonderful home prepared for the children of God. Don't be prodigal. Well, finally, don't be prodigal when it comes to the chance to have your sins forgiven so you can be added to the family of Almighty God. Being a child of God is described as, as being in Christ. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. If we're in Christ, we receive all spiritual blessings. You can have those blessings. You can have them now. What spiritual blessings? Well, let's, let's look at the verses that follow. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Consider what we just read. When a person is in Christ, whenever they're a Christian, whenever they have a obeyed the gospel. The Bible says, number one, you've been chosen from before the foundation of the world. God had in His mind and plans the possibility for mankind to obtain salvation from sins even from the very, very beginning. Now if we'll do that, it says, we then can be holy. Set apart. Set apart from the world. And we then can stand before God, the Creator, without blame. Our souls clean and white. Yep. Being predestinated, chosen by God for salvation. Have we been predestinated? Well, yep. You have. You have. You have. You. I have. Everybody out there has been predestinated to be saved. God wants everybody to be saved. Jesus wants everybody to be saved. The whole world has been predestinated to be saved. But will they take advantage of it? No. They're going to be wasteful. They're going to be prodigal. All have been called. All have been chosen to be saved. But like Peter said, save yourselves from this untoward generation and the majority will not take advantage of the salvation from sins offered. They're going to waste that precious opportunity. They're going to be prodigal. Don't be prodigal. 
Don't be prodigal when it comes to worshiping with the family of God. Don't be prodigal when it comes to the opportunity to have a heavenly home. Don't be prodigal when the invitation is given to pass it by. Let, let the blood of Jesus wash your sins away by your obedience to His gospel. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father accepted that wasteful son back to his family. God will accept you today if you'll come to Him on His terms. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Make up your mind that you're going to follow after the precepts of what the Lord has said. That, that's repentance, change of life. Confess the name of Jesus and then be baptized for the remission of sins. We're going to have the invitation song sung. If you're home and you're watching and you make up your mind that today's the day that I'm not going to be prodigal anymore, I'm not going to waste the opportunity that's been given. Take advantage of it. Give me a call after services and we'll take care of it today. The invitation joins. I wander far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The hands of sin to all I've Lord, I'm coming home. Coming. Oh,